Hey, future respiratory therapist. So guess what, guys? Exciting news. I have a question from an RN. Her name is Bailey Coggins. She put a post. She posted a question on one of my videos yesterday, and I'm gonna answer that question. Now, what I'm gonna do right now is establish a policy, if you will. I don't know if it's necessarily a policy, but just the general state of mind that if an RN ever comes to this channel and asks a question related to respiratory therapy, that person moves to the top of the list. Now, I understand. I look, look, guys. I'm not, I'm not lying here. Look, I got pages and pages and pages of questions, right? You guys know I'm, I'm, I'm. You guys know I'm answering your questions, and I'm getting to them as soon as possible. You know that's happening, so just be patient. But today, because of this nurse Bailey, who has brought a question to me, I'm taking her to the top of the list, and I'm going to get her video out, video out above everybody else's. Now you may be asking yourself, like, well, why? That doesn't make sense, Joe. Why would you? create that type of state of mind? Why would you put yourself in that position? And the answer is this. It goes back to last December. If any of you were watching this channel last December when I had 80 subscribers and very few people watching the videos, I put a video out that was basically around this concept of when the nurse calls you, do you answer it all of the time? Like call me for everything or call me for nothing? Because that's really what it comes down to. You have to understand that nurses are at the bedside. They have their patient load just like we have our patient load. Our patient load is typically much larger than theirs. It's the nature of the game. And, and they call us at various times, sometimes it's very few, sometimes it's a lot, and you have to ask yourself as a respiratory therapist, do I want my nurses to call me for everything that they think falls within my scope, which means any patient who is experiencing any type of difficulty breathing, coughing, wheezing, crackles, needs to be suctioned, whatever, do you want them to call you or you do you only want them to call you either for nothing or when they need something serious. And the answer to that question is, they should call you for everything. If their patient is not breathing well, as the respiratory therapist, we should know about it, which means we should be called, which means we should be a part of solving that patient's breathing difficulties. That's my stance on it. So when a nurse comes to this channel, which is focused on future respiratory therapists and current respiratory therapy issues, we do a lot of things. We got followers on here and subscribers on here who are not student respiratory therapists. They're graduate respiratory therapists. They ask questions, and I love them for that, okay? But the primary focus on this is helping to create an environment and, and, and a place where where current respiratory therapy students are welcome to come to ask questions and receive answers that hopefully make sense and help things come to light for them. Okay? So when a nurse comes to this channel and asks a question, I'm taking their question to the top of the list. Under the same presence of what I've told you, when a nurse calls, you answer. It's as simple as that, respiratory therapists and future respiratory therapists. It's as simple as that. Nurses, registered nurses, call your respiratory therapist anytime your patient is experiencing difficulty breathing or anytime you have a problem with a ventilator or anytime you question your patient's ability to oxygenate or ventilate. We are here to be a part of the team and we should work together. There should not be this sense of animosity towards each other because our disciplines are are essentially a lot alike, but also essentially very different. So I don't care if you call me for the congestive heart failure patient that needs Lasix that you call me for for the PRN arbuterol treatment. I don't care. I'm going to come assess. I'm going to come look at the patient, and I'm going to help you and us together should come to what do we need to do for this patient. So I want to start with that, okay? So Bailey, your question goes to the top of the list. Now here's the question, guys.
okay? And future respiratory therapists, current respiratory therapists, subscribers to this channel, I know you guys understand my stance on this. I know you guys understand and are going to be patient with me and say, I get it. He's living what he's saying. And that's all that's happening here, okay? So here we go, Bailey. The answer to your question. Now, <laughs> I know I keep stepping back. I keep going into the question and I step back. I want to step back just for again for another second. Respiratory therapist and future respiratory therapist. Pay attention to this question because what you're going to see is where our education and our expertise comes into play. Okay, because the question I'm about to pose that came from an RN is a phenomenal question coming from an RN. It really is. It's a good question. But what it does is it illustrates to you the difference in nursing education, education versus respiratory therapy education. And we can say the same thing vice versa. We want to get into electrolytes. You want to, you want to get into electrolytes conversation with a nurse? Probably not, right? So, so understand that, that this question is a great question coming from an RN. This is, a, this is an RN that just through her question demonstrates to me that she is interested in being the very, very, very best RN that she can be. And she wants to know more. She wants to explore more into the world of mechanical ventilation and the world of respiratory therapy to understand what we're doing and where we're coming from. And so Bailey, I thank you so much for this opportunity, not just to answer this question for you, but to also address this, this, this big elephant in the room where RNs and RTs don't always mesh because despite our likenesses, we're also very different in what we do. And, the, and, 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 and I love the fact that this comes to light on this channel. RTs, give report at the bedside in front of the nurse so they can hear about the details of what we do. And when that happens, they recognize and they understand our value that we bring to the bedside. I think they probably already get that anyways. I think we get their value at the bedside, but it just pisses me off when I see so many memes on Instagram and Twitter and all the negative talk towards nurses and vice versa. Nurses towards RTs, there's no sense. There's no need for this bitterness and this rivalness between the two disciplines. We are there for one reason, taking care of sick people. That's why the nurses are there, and that's why the RTs are there. So blend yourself together and learn how to work with your nurses, not against them. And nurses, learn to work with your RTs, not against them. It's that simple, guys. The world, the healthcare world, and the healthcare environment would be so much more harmonious if this, if this sense of, of discontent between the two disciplines went away. Some places it's phenomenal. We love them. Everybody says, oh, we love our RTs, we love our nurses, everything's great. But there's a lot of places out there where that's not the case. So put all that aside. If you work in a place where there's a lot of discontent, today start working towards building and repairing that relationship and becoming an environment to where the two disciplines work to, together for the betterment of the patient. Now, Bailey, here's the answer to your question. And her question is, for everybody watching, if a patient is on a ventilator, and if plateau pressure represents alveolar compliance, and peak pressure represents airway resistance, then why don't we set a plateau pressure alarm instead of a peak inspiratory pressure alarm. Now, Bailey, this is a phenomenal question, okay? And the answer is quite simple. So here, I'm going to give it to you here, okay? The simple question, the simple answer is this. We don't have a plateau pressure alarm. And the reason we don't have a plateau pressure alarm is that in some of our modes of mechanical ventilation, a plateau pressure is not evaluated on every breath. 
If we did evaluate a plateau pressure on every breath, we would lengthen I time, decrease E time, and increase the risk for air trapping. So we can only assess plateau pressure when we perform an inspiratory hold. This means that the mechanical ventilator gives its breath and then we do an inspiratory hold and after the breath moves through the airways and settles in the alveoli, we get this plateau pressure. So on our, on our mechanical ventilator, on our, on our waveforms that we should be looking at, okay? And nurses, <laughs> this is an indication to the quality of respiratory therapist you have. Okay, I'm going to say this because I hope I get a whole lot of more nurses watching these videos because I would love to see that happen. Okay, not because I care about subscribers and nobody making money off of this. I'm just talking. I would love to have a whole bunch of RNs come in and say, hey, talk to me about this. Okay, but look, here's what it comes down to. When we're looking at our graphics, and if your RT has the screen pulled up on their ventilator and there's not any ventilator graphics, means you don't see the funky waveforms and all you see is a bunch of different numbers, that's your first clue that your respiratory therapist is, is not as advanced as you might think. Respiratory therapist, come on guys. Get that damn all those numbers off the screen. Get your waveforms up and visible at all times and use your waveforms, use your graphics to be able to tell from the door when you're walking past the room, going to your next room, to be able to assess your patient. That's what this comes down to. That's, that's the truth, guys. I can tell you right now, I can walk into the unit right now, I can walk around and look at different ventilators, if I see a bunch of numbers on the screen, that's a, that's a respiratory therapist that's, that's, that, that's checking boxes and filling in numbers. If I see graphics up on the screen, I know I'm working with a res respiratory therapist that is actually assessing air trapping, actually assessing peak airway pressures from a visual standpoint. Okay? So that's my first thing. Have your graphics up. So when we look at the graphics, Bailey, what we look at is this. We're talking about a pressure waveform. On a volume breath, the pressure waveform will look something like this. Now, if you have PEEP set in, let me, get, let, me get, let me erase this. Let me start over, actually. If we have a PEEP of 5 set, then baseline starts at 5, pressure goes up, comes back, and returns to 5. Now what we notice here is that peak inspiratory pressure is here. This is PIP. Now this waveform does not have a plateau pressure. And this is how most waveforms in volume control ventilation look. So if you're in AC or if you're in SIMV volume control, then you're going to get breaths that look like this. Now not until you do an inspiratory hold do you assess where the plateau pressure is. So this is our plateau pressure. Now what you said is exactly right. Plateau pressure equals alveolar compliance. And this is what we are concerned about in most cases. Now our PIP pressure is a reflection of our airway resistance, so I'm going to put airway resist here, and alveolar compliance. Okay, the and there is the most important part of this discussion, and alveolar compliance. So, to answer your question, why don't we set a plateau alarm instead of a PIP alarm? It's because one, Ventilators don't let us, and it's two, because if we set the PIP alarm, then we will also be getting information on not just the airway resistance, but also the alveolar compliance. So when our PIP alarm starts going off as respiratory therapists, we go in and assess, and we look at it, and we go, is this 
an airway problem or is this an alveolar problem? Okay, if we assess and we have wheezing or maybe even crackles, excessive secretions that come across as crackles and we do an assessment and we find something that looks like this on our waveforms, this is our PIP, this is our PLAT. The difference between the two is our airway resistance. If we have a big drop from PIP to PLAT, then we know it's an airway resistance problem and we don't have an alveolar compliance problem. Now, if we go and look at it and it looks like this, where this is our PIP, and this is our plat, and the difference is very small, then we know we do not have an airway resistance problem. And in this case, we have an alveolar compliance problem. So you were almost 100% correct in your question. If plat represents alveolar compliance, which it does, and PIP represents airways, then why don't we set a plateau alarm? Well, what you missed was that PIP is the combination of airway resistance and alveolar compliance. It's not just the airways, it's both of them together. That's the answer to your question. Bailey, tell all your nurse friends about this channel and all of you submit questions and all of you will go to the top of the list. And for all you future respiratory therapists and current respiratory therapists watching this channel, I'll get to your questions also, okay? Respond to your nurses, show them love, fix their problems, and see if you don't get shown love in return. Best wishes to everybody. I love being a part of the healthcare team, guys. I, I can't tell you how much joy it brings to me to be teaching respiratory therapy students, working with, with nurses, working with other respiratory therapists and helping to improve sick patients' lives or at the very least making their hospital experience the very best that it can be. That's it, guys. Just go make people feel good and be happy, okay? Best wishes.